Let's talk about is a good man hard to find? Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's podcast, we're going to be exploring the concept of a good man and where has he gone? This was inspired through a Discord comment or slash suggestion on my Discord. If you join, it supports the content and there is a tab for you to suggest your own topics for me to cover. So this was sent in by a very lovely person and I'm very excited to tackle this question today. So the question is as follows. Why do some people push the narrative that, quote, good men are hard to find slash most men suck? What bubbles are these? I'm not talking about the anti-male feminist bubbles in this instance, but other bubbles that push the sentiment more subtly or lightly. What role do certain bubbles with this sentiment have in creating good men they so seemingly think are rare to find? What conditions created this? Is it really a men problem or is it a human problem that certain bubbles can't seem to find certain individuals with traits they value? Now there's more to their question, but that's what I wanna focus on. This is a very different question than the typical question we've been tackling on the internet. Are good men hard to find? What's a quality man? What's a high value man? What's a high value woman? This is a specific question. This isn't talking about anti-feminist bubbles. This is talking about the bubbles that say they are good men, but they still can't find them. I'm a good man. There are good men. Men are good. Men are amazing. But then where are the men, right? A recent study just showed that older millennials for the first time are once again not getting married. And so millennials who are about the age of 40 are experiencing a less likelihood of marriage. I have a brother in his 40s who's actually struggling to find a spouse, though he's looking for someone very specific. And so it's a little harder for him. But he is one of those millennials, right? And then I myself was a sort of mid-millennial, right, born in 89, who just recently found her person about a year ago. So I myself, even people were doubting my ability to find a person. But what I ended up discovering was that he didn't so much find him as we both ended up stumbling, 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 stumbling into each other's life because we are both sort of just casually interested in a certain thing, philosophy, communities, uh, YouTube content, and happened to come across each other. We weren't looking for a person. We weren't trying to find them. We just sort of were living our life and ended up meeting and then ended up falling in love, right? In the bubbles, like the anti-male feminist bubbles, like in those specific bubbles in which women are curating through their pain, hurt, and trauma, a disdain for men, they are already sort of a lost cause. They can't see good men when good men approach them. But also, if you're in a cynical part of your life, if you're in a very trauma-based part of your life, you might not be able to see the good in anyone, not even yourself. So this, I think, is very important. You guys know, I think most people are good because most people are trying their best. But if I had to be more critical of what a good person is, there is a criteria I expect them to uh, adhere to, but it's Brittany's criteria. So at the end of this video, I will share Brittany's criteria for a good man, i.e. a good partner, because like, what is gender? But overall, when society is talking about a good man, it depends on which culture, which opinion, which bubble they're coming from. So a religious person is going to have a different criteria for a good man versus maybe a red pill bubble. And so when you're having this sort of quandary over like, what is a good man? You first have to ask yourself, what is a good person? Regardless of gender, what is good? What does good even mean? When I first read this question on Discord, I started to Google, just going down a rabbit hole of like, are good men hard to find? I had to ask that question. And I was Googling and I came across this short story by Flannery O'Connor called A Good Man is Hard to Find. And I was like, oh my gosh, what is this? What is this short story that I missed out on that apparently some people had read in school, but I hadn't read it. I was homeschooled till I was 15. So I think I probably missed out on it. But there is an audio version from a YouTuber called Hannah's Books, which I listened to yesterday and I just fell in love with the story. It's so good. It's so just a wonderful example of human behavior. I'm gonna share some clips in this podcast, but please go check out Hannah's Books channel and hear the story for yourself because it's really, really good. And it's a great example of what does it mean to be faced in uh, sort of faced 
uh, how do I say this? Fa- uh, put in a position where you're faced with the goodness in yourself and the goodness you can see in others. And whether or not the good person you think is the good person in the story was ever good to begin with. In the story, we're following a family who's heading to Florida. A grandma, her son, his wife, and their children. Throughout the story, mostly through the perspective of the grandma, we're seeing her plot, scheme, sort of selfishly hope that they derail into a different direction so she can do what she wants in a different place. She has this narr- like this um, narrative going on in her head that is, you know, everyone is so silly, everyone is beneath her, everyone is not as good as her. Well, you can see that she herself is so struggling with that form of weakness I really despise in people, which is that form of weakness that brings down others with you. The grandma, so dependent on her son and the goodness of his heart and the goodness of his wife, is so selfishly ignorant to the ways that people have been helping her. She goes on rants during the story that just crack me up, right? This was written in, um, hold on, 1950, where's this book? This book was written in 1953, and that's what's even funnier is there's a part in the story where the grandma is just ranting and raving about how kids used to respect their elders, how there used to be a better time in society. Let's go through Georgia fast so we won't have to look at it much, John Wesley said. If I were a little boy, said the grandmother, I wouldn't talk about my native state that way. Tennessee has the mountains, and Georgia has the hills. Tennessee is just a hillbilly dumping ground, John Wesley said, and Georgia is a lousy state, too. You said it, June Starr said. In my time, said the grandmother, folding her thin, veined fingers, children were more respectful of their native states and their parents and everything else. People did right then sound familiar is that not what we're doing right now there used to be a better time this nostalgia for the past I think is so generational it happens every time even amongst millennials oh I remember when people would socialize differently I remember when I had to wait to use the phone because the internet would have to you know I I would I remember I remember it's like we're obsessed with this I remember a better time Even if you look at the red pill circles and like the alpha male circles are like, there used to be a better time. If you watch pearly things, there used to be a better time. If you watch so many people, they're obsessed with this better time that I don't think ever existed. I think it's just existed for you at a time, but also did it? Because if I go back and I think about the memories of my past, I think about how many good times there were, but also I've kind of forgotten all the bad times. Not literally forgotten, but I forgot how bad it was for me. I have to go back to my old YouTube videos to remember how sad I was, depressed I was, how, you know, uh, unaliving I felt at the time. I had to go back to remind myself of, oh yeah, you really survived something. You really overcame. Your life is easy now, but it was never easy before. It was a struggle every day, every minute, right? So I think there is sort of a psychological phenomenon that's happening in our brains, which allows us to coat over how hard our past was. And I think there's something to be said about that. Even later on in the story, there's like a scene where they go to a restaurant. They're like getting food at a diner. And the people at the diner, Red Sam, is talking about how, oh, I used to be able to keep my doors unlocked. It used to be safe in this town. And now I can't do that anymore. That's a narrative I had growing up. I used to say, oh, I leave my doors unlocked, no biggie. Even when I lived in California, I was like, oh, I leave my doors unlocked. When I lived in Arizona, I was like, I leave my doors unlocked. But I always lived in the country. I lived on private dirt roads. I lived on horse property. I didn't live in the city. I didn't live in the suburb. So it's kind of different. Now we lock our doors because I live in the city and I'm a little bit more cautious. But there was never really a time in which it was safer to keep your doors unlocked. There was only ever an area. There was only ever a location. There was only ever a vibe. And so when we have this like nostalgia of what is good from the past, we have to remember that it still exists in the present. It just might look differently or might be somewhere differently, right? Oh my gosh, it's so hot in this room. As the story progresses, we learn that in the news recently, there was a misfit. They call him the misfit. This criminal who basically was murdering people or committing crimes. And the grandma has this sort of main character ness to her that says like I'm gonna run into the misfit what if he came and robbed this store what if he came and came into this area and the people around her are the same Red Sam and his wife and the people around her are chitty chatter like oh I, I could imagine him coming to rob us him coming to bother us and you're thinking and I'm thinking as the reader well what are the chances you run into the misfit 
Well, considering that the story is about the misfit and this grandma, pretty high. But in real life, are we ever really going to run into, quote unquote, the misfit? Well, in the story, she runs into him. And it brings her and her family to their demise. It's a very moving story. It's very interesting. But throughout the last moments of their lives, the grandma and the misfit have a dialogue. And the dialogue is supposed to show the reader what is good. And the grandma keeps screaming to him, I know you're a good man. I know you're a good man. I know you're not common blood. But she found she was looking at the misfit squatting on the ground in front of her. I just know you're a good man, she said desperately. You're not a bit common. No, I ain't a good man, the misfit said after a second, as if he had considered her statement carefully. But I ain't the worst in the world, neither. My daddy said I was a different breed of dog from my brothers and sisters. You know, daddy said, it's some that can live their whole life without asking about it. And it's others has to know why it is. And this boy is one of the latter's. He's going to be into everything. Which I had to Google what it meant at that time in 1953 to say you're not common. I can tell you're not common. It means common blood. It means that she, because of her self-aggrandizing, narcissistic, egoistic self, because she believes she's the main character, because she believes she comes from good blood, because she believes there is a hierarchy of good and bad and icky and, and superior, She's trying to appeal to that part of him that doesn't exist within him. The misfit doesn't have any uh, belief system or revolving ego that tells him that his commonness or his lack of commonness puts him above others. Jesus, the old lady cried. You've got good blood. I know you wouldn't shoot a lady. I know you come from nice people. Pray, Jesus, you ought not to shoot a lady. I'll give you all the money I've got. Lady, the misfit said, looking beyond her far into the woods, there never was a body that gave the undertaker a tip. The irony is that the misfit sees this in the grandma. He sees a part of her gun to her head that wants to appeal to the so-called Christian in her. But in order to appeal to the Christian in her, she becomes a sniveling, whining baby who goes, I'll give you all my money. I'll give you everything. She tries to appeal to his ego. She basically tries to suck him off ego through his ego. So it's a very specific type of perceived goodness that is actually riddled in what you could call bad. And so the irony is that the misfit says, after he kills her, that gun to her head, you know, she almost had the chance of being good. If only somebody would hold a gun to her head every day so she could sort of challenge that goodness within her. This story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, is like an interesting concept because for generation after generation after generation, we've had this narrative, as far as we know, that good men are hard to find. And especially if you look on YouTube and you go to certain bubbles or, or opinion-based podcasts in which people are expressing what all men are like, you sort of do start to believe, are good men hard to find? Because if this is a good man, I don't want one. And then the irony of, the cycle that we're dealing with is like, let's say these alpha males, these red pillars that are discussing, you know, what a good man is, but then says a man is still weak when it comes to needing to sleep around and be a philanderer and be sort of a cheater. That kind of reality that they're saying is common amongst men encourages women to become more feminist and encourages women to not need a man. What good is a man if he's going to cheat? What good is a man if he's going to go out on me? What good is a man if he's not in this as my teammate? Now, for some women, they might settle into those relationships or even desire them. That's fine. But overall, does this make you a good man? To the man on, let's say, the recent whatever podcast, yes, that makes him a good man. To someone like me, no, he doesn't fit my criteria of a good man because he's not disciplined enough and he gives in to his weaknesses. See, in the story, good men are hard to find, the grandma is given an opportunity to sort of face her death with dignity, but she doesn't. She succumbs to weakness. The misfit, who's a man who feels like he was pushed into this circumstance, no matter how he lived his life, he'd be punished by the system. So why not kill somebody? Why not steal? Why not be a criminal? There's no incentive for him to be better, but in some ways he's good in his own right, but also 
bad, but also neutral because he didn't have a belief system to begin with in which he could be better. He was raised in a family that he deemed good, but he could tell he was different. He even said, I think he says, my papa tells me I was always a little different. So he has set himself up to not even give himself the option of being better. Though the grandma tries to encourage him, the grandma tries to say, what about Jesus? What about praying? What about redemption? Maybe they got it wrong. Maybe they sent you to prison unjustly. And he's like, no, nah, they said they got papers on me. I never saw the papers, but they said I did something. So I must have done something, but I don't even know what I've done. So I'm being punished for something that I don't even have an awareness of. That is sometimes what life can feel like for so many of us, that we're being punished for just being men. We're being punished for just being women. We're being punished for just existing. This is a phenomenon that crosses every every identity if you're trans sometimes you feel like you're punished for just being alive if you're gay if you're black if you're white if we're all having this relationship with this alienation phenomenon where do we start to wonder where do we start to pause and say okay if we're all having this experience how do we avoid it can we avoid it if we allow freedom in the universe and people to discriminate which leads to chaos right is it just a part of being a human? Is the idea of good or bad just so subjective on the culture, the, op the opinion, the bubble, that we're never going to avoid it, right? And then if that's the case, is there any incentive to be a better person? I know sometimes I hear this narrative on the internet, and it's so strange when people say it out loud, where men will say, you know, women should be grateful that men don't sort of enslave them, that because of men, women are allowed to exist without being raped on a higher rate, without being enslaved. And I hear this from them and I wonder if they know what they sound like. It's like recently Justin Bieber's dad during Pride Month said, you know, think a heterosexual, think a straight person. Because without them, you wouldn't have your legal rights as gay people. But without straight people, we would never have had them taken away either. And so the irony is that people can't understand that, yes, it's a cycle. In some ways, white people, you know, freed black people, but white people also enslaved black people and then had to free them. And then black people enslaved other black people. And then straight people enslaved queer people and queer people. And there's just this like cycle that's going to continue, which is why straight white males feel like they're being targeted right now because minority groups are having a voice but now all they're feeling is the same feeling minorities have felt their whole lives so we're doing this to each other consistently over and over and over again and then the question I have for you is are we going to stop the cycle or are we going to just continue it and survive within our game we're playing to the best of our ability so what does this have to do with me finding the perfect man to marry it has to do with this idea of a good man as I was listening or contemplating this question, not listening, as I was contemplating this question from the Discord, I was really thinking about, well, I think I found a good man. But what does it mean to find a good man with a partner who doesn't constantly think about his gender that way? He just thinks about being a good person. And I do too. I'm not really thinking or worried about being a good woman. I'm really just worried about being a good person. And I did ask on Twitter a bunch of you questions. I asked on Discord questions, and we'll cover that in a second. But I did ask you guys, and many of you brought that up, well, what's what's the good of being a good man if you're not a good person? If you're a good person, aren't you a good man? Uh, isn't a good man just a person who happens to be male who's good? And I think, yes, ultimately, gender has little to do with good or bad. But I think ultimately, depending on the cultural bubble you're in, the expectation you have for yourself, you might have different standards of that good. So in a Catholic bubble, the standard of a good man is a man who doesn't cheat on his wife. But if you go to the whatever podcast and you listen to these alpha males, quote unquote, their idea of a good man is someone who provides income. But if women in the West are overall going to end up being the breadwinners in the next 30, 40 years, depending on how things go, then a good man can't be predicated on his ability to provide money because that's not fair. It should be predicated on their ability to be a good team. But then what does it mean to have a team in which you exist in a bubble in which men are supposed to be the higher, like in a hierarchical sense, like the top and women sort of the bottom. And then the question is, why are we creating these constructs to put ourselves in cages in which we can never fulfill these roles to the best of our ability? If we want to be the best, should we not be able to adopt? 
Oh, adapt. Wait. <laughs> if we want to be our best, should we not be able to adapt? If we want to be our best, should we not be able to change? But in order to change, you have to be open-minded to the idea that the bubble or belief system you were born into isn't actually objective enough to lead you into the progressive future. And I don't mean progressive like blue hair and nose piercings. I mean progressive, progressive in terms of adaptation can we evolve past the narratives we're born into and then do we or should we want to like do we have the moral obligation to evolve past our own belief systems our own egos that's sort of a different question but then coincides with this idea of being a good ex good woman a good man now some people did say why are we asking what a good man is what about a good woman even recently, when I watched this whatever podcast through Abba and Preach, people on Abba and Preach's video were like, does Abba and Preach only shit on men? Why don't they ever shit on women? And it's like, are you new? But that's the problem. No matter who you are, if you only consume certain amounts of content, you will think everyone's always just shitting on men. But if you grow up in the bubbles I did, women are always the butt of the joke. They're always being shit on. They're always the never good enough. So depending on where you're born, you're going to hear different narratives. And the issue is thinking that the one you hear is the one that's always objective for everyone else or the one that's always the most dominant. Again, menosphere men feel like men are getting the short end of the stick. But how do you think women have felt since the beginning of time? And again, if you're a man and you're thinking, I just want to be taken care of, then be a submissive or be a bottom or allow your woman to be the breadwinner. If you want to be a woman, if you're so jealous that women get to just be at home and be with their kids, then be a stay-at-home dad. And you might say, well, women don't seem to want this. I think in straight communities, there does seem to be a desire for straight women to have a very specific relationship with straight men. So ultimately, if straight people want to continue this narrative that a man provides and a woman takes care of the household, that's okay. But then men shouldn't want what women have. And men shouldn't be resentful. I don't understand how you say, this is what I want, but also I'm going to be bitter about it. This is what I want, but I'm going to be bitter. Is it what you want if you're still bitter in the end? I don't understand that. When I first talked to my partner, it was clear that something was different about him. Something stood out about the way he held himself and the way he spoke about himself. There was a specific energy to the conversation. There was a specific, oh, there's something different about him. But what could have been so different about a person that I was talking to um, without even seeing his face, by the way, because we were talking on voice chat? What was so different? And it was, a, it was the way he spoke about himself. The way he viewed himself in relation to the world, so the existing and relation to existence, the way he spoke about his self-awareness, the way he was holding himself accountable for maybe his um, the things he lacked in. There is such an ego to a lot of the men of the world where they just can't admit when they're at fault and they're not interested in getting better that I think is just very, very off-putting to a lot of women. But the men that I hear from that struggle with this the most, the toxic masculinity bubbles, they really struggle with being weak in front of their women. They don't want to cry. They don't want to um, trust in their women. They don't want to come to their women with their problems. Well, that's fine. And you can probably date women who would like that, women who don't want to see their men cry. But I think those numbers are dwindling. I think the progressive evolutionary prog progressive direction that the human species will go in is going to be in a direction where people are more self-aware about their feelings, are more self-aware about the complexities of being a man and a woman. How can you ask women to empathize with being men, to care about men's feelings when you don't show it to us? And in turn, how can women ask men to trust them if women continue to play games where they don't confide in their men or they do things sort of in a malicious manner or they do things like the grandma did in the story where she's always just kind of manipulating her son to do what she wants instead of just saying, can we go here instead? She like manipulates, right? Why do we keep playing games and winning stupid prizes and then calling ourselves intelligent and smart? At what point are we going to realize we're the problem, right? But in order to be open to change, you have to be open to shattering the thing that built you in the first place. And that is scary. So when I first started talking, when I first started talking to my partner and I realized like, oh, this man is different. This human, this consciousness, I want to talk to this person more. 
I was so open at the time, though I was very sick and getting diagnosed with fibro and just like a total mess, I was not going to pass up the opportunity to continue talking to someone that was so interesting to me, that was so wonderful and kind and considerate and funny and intelligent and like all the things that I'm like, what is this? And it's special and it's specific, but not special like a pedestal, special to me, to Brittany. So I'm looking for a good man a good person, a good consciousness based off of my standard. And that is specific. It's not going to match yours. It's just, it can't match yours. It wouldn't make sense, right? Because I am looking for something specific to my values. And my values are subjective. They're not objective. And neither are yours. But that's the thing. You might believe they are. So you might say something like, Sneeko would say like, Modern women are destroying the family and the family should be the focus. But where did Sneeko get those belief systems? Who taught it to him? Islam? What is Islam? Islam is a construct created by a bunch of people who came together and decided to believe in this thing and then claimed they had a relationship with a spiritual god and magical powers. And then they, you know, curated a religion and a culture and they bring in people to join it. It's like a club. That's fine. But they didn't come from Sneeko. They came from someone outside of himself. So he is in the matrix as much as anyone else. He is relying on other people to tell him how to think, which is fine. But what do you do when you're more of an individual? What do you do when you don't want and don't need the world to tell you how to think? You want to derive your own values from your own joy. And you want to find a partner who also helps you continue that line of joy. You have to find someone who matches your values. And to me, that's what makes my partner so good. Because I think I'm a good person. But I have values that are specific to me. And what I want to do is I do want to explore that idea, again, of what is a good good man, good person. Someone sent that to me. They're like, well, what do you think a good man is? Okay, so in order for me to have found the perfect man to marry, he would have met my criteria. So I wrote this down as sort of a jumping off point for you and I to sort of define things specifically. Being uh, good can be defined differently based off criteria. I wrote down three things. You're doing your best. Only matters when tested, being good. And then being good could be doing more than your best. So as an example, I think you're good if you're doing your best, which I think is pretty low. I'm asking humans the lowest standard. I am Brittany. I am Brittany. I'm defining good based off the lowest standard in this moment. Then you could say that I would say you're good based off of when you're tested. So like in the story, good or, um, a good man is hard to find. The grandma is tested based off of... Uh, or she, her goodness is tested in that moment when she's facing death, right? And she fails, to be honest. And then the third one is doing more than your best. This would be like the Sneeko reality, the Sneeko opinion, the Sneeko bubble, which says you have to do more than your best. You have to excel past your standard. I think ideally you would do all three. Ideally, I live my life by doing all three. My partner lives his life by doing all three, which does sort of – make us unique in a way because most people usually settle for the basics which is why I hold other people to the lowest standard doing your best doing your best means you're a good person that is me holding the universe to the lowest possible standard the next standard is well hopefully when you have temptation and you're faced with temptation you make a good decision not all people make those decisions not all people are strong in all moments so that would be ideal is for that second point which is sort of the religious bubble, is um, when you're faced with temptation, do good, right? Because religious people do tend to be more, I think, I would argue a little bit more, if they're practicing their religion in a serious way, I think they do tend to be a little bit better at not giving in tempta- into temptation than secularists because secularists would have to form their own values as strong as religion to adhere to them when temptation came up, and they might not know how to do that. And then the third is doing more than your best. So again, this is the idea that Sneeko has, that he wants the world to do better than the basics. He wants them to rise above their their standard. But the dilemma is how you have a relationship with that can differ. I might say as a person who desires progressive evolution, adaptation, to adapt to the newest, greatest thing, the greatest next step of human development, I would argue that you need to get past religion because religion has too many constraints. But then Sneeko might argue that in order to be your best, you have to fight temptation and having a religion forces you to go past your best, which is your standard. So depending on how you're having a relationship with this, each tool is going to do different things. 
So again, when I say I found the perfect man to marry, I'm really saying I found the perfect human to marry, the consciousness that is my partner. I don't care if he's a man. I don't care if he's a they. I don't care if he's a she. I don't care what he is. What I care about is the person, the consciousness that embodies that physical body is a wonderful human who embodies all three of these requirements. And so for Brittany, that's like a ding. He's number one. When giving in to temptation, when faced he learned from his mistakes. He does better. He doesn't even justify them. He literally will say, oh, yeah, that's when I failed as like a person versus other people will say, well, you know, I was just I was in a mood. I lost my mind. I, you don't even know how hard it was for me in that moment. They get defensive. Defensiveness is not interesting to me because it's it's not it's not self-aware. And when you're lacking self-awareness, like you lose automatically an ability to be my partner. I ask you one more question. Far away. Honey. Okay. <laughs> um, if you have a place in only one place in your heart for one woman, or you want to have one woman in your heart, I think you said, why don't you just commit to one and choose to be faithful to her? I'm just not wired that way. I spent my whole 20s trying to fix myself. I thought something was wrong with me. You have you, you work out, you do business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can possess your own, your own power it's and you not, direct it the way you want to direct it. It's not how I am. It's not how I am. I've you tried. think that might be a limited mindset? I think it's none of your business, but I don't want you to think I'm triggered by you. I'm not. Okay. I saw somebody say that, and I think that's interesting. I think you're annoying, but I'm not triggered. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No, you are. You're annoying in, in like this goody two shoes type way, and that's fine. Uh, I'm going to live my life on my terms, unapolog uh, unapologetically, like truly. Going back to the original Discord question, okay? Are good men hard to find? Why do certain bubbles say like good men exist, but they're so hard to find? Or men will say, I'm a good man. Why is it so hard to find a good woman? I don't think any of you are being totally honest with what you think good is. And I don't think you're being honest with how good you are. A lot of the people that I talk to, sometimes we'll do calls together. Sometimes we're just talking on comments. Sometimes we're just talking on the Discord. A lot of people will say, like, I'm a good person, but they're cheating. I'm a good person, but they kind of are toxic and verbally abuse their spouses. I'm a good person, but they neglect their children and they're not in their lives. I'm a good person, but I want to have seven families that I take care of. I'm a good person. Yes, you're good because you're doing the basics, much like an animal is good because they're doing the basics. But what is making you exceptional? What is actually making you fit the standard that you want from somebody else? Like these med pill menosphere guys, they always want loyalty from their women, but they don't want to give it back. So what does it mean to say, I want loyalty from you, but I'm not going to give it because I'm a man and I have to give into my evolutionary monkey brain and I have to spread my seed. If a guy decides to have a bunch of children, I mean, you see it happen all the time. Guy gets married, he's a shitty father, shitty husband, ends up getting a divorce and then goes have and has babies with the next chick doing the same thing I'm doing stuff. I'm not a lying coward about it. I hear you. So I, I, I see that. I see that. But I think the big question is, I mean, it seems like you're really focused on self-improvement, which is awesome. And so I guess my question would be, is it ideal? Like, what are we striving towards individually, right? And what do we think is best for society? And I think kids want to know their parents love each other and are committed till death do they part to each other. Yep. Didn't and say so, any of that wasn't true. But you're it, the but one saying you, that's not true. Okay. But do you think it would be a little bit um, confusing for one of your kids if they found out, let's say, theoretically. No, because if they trust have, me enough to come to me, I'll just tell them the truth. What are we talking about? I'm not hiding from anything. I just told you. I, I understand that. It so seems like you're challenging because you have a problem with it. I simply don't care. So your, your, your kids, you're saying you don't care if they find out you have multiple mistresses. If I had multiple women mother. and then my kids came to me, then I would just talk to them like a, like an adult. If they're adult enough to ask, I'm adult enough to tell them. Though. Well, whatever they ask, I'm there for. You know, that's it. Find somebody else. I don't feel bad. I'm going to live in truth. Here's the difference between me and most men. Most men are doing this shit behind people's back, right? Like a fucking coward. And they're not even giving the family the life that they deserve. So if I choose to do that in the future, which I have not said I'm going to do, then so be it. What does it say when you say I'm disciplined, but not when it comes to spreading my seed? I'm disciplined, but not when it comes to this. So you're admitting you're weak. You're admitting you have a flaw. You're admitting you can't deny temptation, but you don't phrase it that way. You say it was just, it's just the way I am. It's just the way I am. Okay. Not good enough. Not good enough. For Brittany, maybe it's good enough for you, but not for me. Now, before I go into my, what I think, well, okay, I made a little test. Well, not a little test. I made a little spreadsheet like I've been doing lately, which I think is really helpful of the four criteria requirements, I think, of knowing if you've got a good person or the person that's good enough for you. But before I jump into that, I actually want to go over some comments I got. I ended up posting this question on YouTube and on Discord and on Twitter asking you guys, um, you know, where have all the good men gone? 
Do you consider yourself to be a good man? What line would you have to cross to consider yourself a bad one? Because that's the question I don't think a lot of people are answering. Just like in this whatever podcast with this man who was saying, I'm a good man, but I am weak when it comes to these things and I have to give in to temptation. So where is his line? If he's a good man here, where is his line for being a bad one? Is it not supplying people with money? Great. Studies show that your kids care less about money and care more about hugs and kisses and time spent with them. So that's not very helpful to having a good, healthy family. And you're probably doing as much damage to your kids by, by, by not being there as the people you claim are doing bad jobs, like being a single parent. You basically are a single parent at that moment if you're not coming home. Elon Musk is not a good dad. If you're not seeing your children, not tucking them into bed, if you're not being active in their lives and you're just paying their bills, okay, that's called a sugar daddy. And it's not exactly being a father, but I, okay, you do you. You're doing your best, lowest minimum requirement, not good enough for Britney's standards. Okay. And then do you think the quality of men is declining? So I got a couple of comments here and I just want to read them. I don't share usernames usually because I just want to give people a sense of privacy, but here are the comments. I got this one on Discord. There are good men, they said. There are bad men. There are good women. There are bad women. I feel like if you're having issues with men or women back to back, that's a sign you need to look within yourself to find a better answer than men bad, women bad. How about, is there something I am doing wrong to cause these relationships to crumble? Does the type of person I am seeking match what I actually need? Am I actually communicating properly with partners? Where am I finding these bad partners that I keep finding? Is relation is having relationships really what I need or just what I want? Personally, when it comes to me, I choose to self-reflect and observe my own environment first before I project on others. Let me tell you, when I see a woman who said, oh, I've been cheated on in every relationship, I'm like, red flag. If you've been cheated on in every relationship, you're doing something wrong. If you find yourself needing to cheat in every relationship, you're the problem. If I didn't learn from my last relationship where I was cheated on and I kept dating men like him... I would have continued being cheated on. And at that point, it would have been a self-sabotage on my end. It wouldn't have been my fault that I was cheated on. That's their action. But it would have been my fault for continuing making the mistake of dating a certain type of man. If I dated a red pillar or an alpha male and he kept cheating on me, even though it's not technically cheating because they're pretty upfront with it and they say they're going to do it. So really it's, do I want to feel like my consent doesn't matter? Or do I want to consent to this environment? That would be on me. I don't have to settle for that kind of a man. I can get a better one. And I did. I got a loyal, wonderful, kind, compassionate, open-minded, introspective person. And I waited 33 years to meet this person. And I do not regret it. And now I'm here living in Europe, having the best time of my life with the best person I've ever met on this planet. And I am so glad we found each other, that we ran into each other. But I don't think we would have been good for each other in our 20s. In my 20s, when I was still self-reflecting, dating people that weren't good for me, learning all of the things that were wrong with me so I could get better, I really spent my life getting ready and preparing myself to be the best partner for him as he did for me. We had to live it out our 20s so we could be together in our 30s. There was no way him and I would have been compatible in our 20s. So all these red pillars that want virgins and people who haven't slept around, great. But if you're a Britney... You need to do things to figure out how to become the best version of yourself. Now, of course, I'm speaking for a very specific kind of audience. I'm speaking for myself, a very individualistic person, a very self-sufficient person, a neurodivergent person, a mentally ill person. Like, So I am very much a very specific, unique person, which means I need a very specific, unique kind of good person to understand me enough to be with me, right? It is so hot in here. I can't even explain to you how hot it is. Okay. This comment says, my knee-jerk reaction is that our awareness of toxic masculinity and patriarchy has helped us raise the bar for good men. So fewer and fewer measure up. Some men slash mask people take that as a call to do better. Others act like it's an attack. Overall, I think that raising our standards is a good thing. We just have to come to terms with the fact that doing so will trigger disappointment and disgust of the status quo. I think that's very true, at least for somebody like me. Your text, like, has, as somebody who suffers from toxic masculinity more than my male partner, I will tell you, because I'm such a boy, like, I will tell you that there is, and again, a progression happening. We're being self-aware about your feelings, your mental health, your stability is more and more attractive to a woman than somebody who doesn't know those things about themselves. What good is a man if he's going to get pissy? What good is a man if he's not going to know how to talk to his sons or daughters? What good is a man if he doesn't have a relationship with his emotions? 
you're only as good as what? Your paycheck at that point? Cool. Then you're going to attract gold diggers. The irony, once again, of these men is that the only thing they provide for these women is money. And then they're like, why do I only attract gold diggers? Ma'am, again, if you want your women to care about your feelings, you have to know you have them in the first place. The next comment is, a good man is a good person. That happens to be male. At the most basic level, I think showing consideration for others is a good measuring stick for a high quality character in a person. Can't go wrong with the golden rule. Do unto others as you'd like them to do unto you. Commit actions that evoke in others the feelings you wish to experience yourself. I think I agree for the most part, especially with the first part. A good man is a good person. I agree. What does gender matter when we're talking about being good? But I do think the golden rule has a trap. And I learned this when I had my stalker who literally is the psychology of a stalker is very specific. I think she is doing onto me what she would want for herself. She wants attention, so she's giving me attention, but I want her to stop. But she can't stop because that's what she wants. So the irony is like do unto others as you want them to do unto you is not always good because I do think in some ways these like alpha male red pill guys, they are treating women the way they want to be treated. They're objectifying them. They're treating them like they're not really in love. They are treating them sort of like – you should be grateful you're with me. And then the only kinds of women that are around them are women with the same attitude. And frankly, I think it's a cycle for disaster. I think it's why a lot of them are unmarried. I think it's why a lot of them feel like they're settling. A lot of the women on Fresh and Fit often talk about like, okay, I would I would put up with it if you paid my bills. I would put up with your behavior if you paid my bills. You're basically creating the cycle that you see, that you seem to hate. You are literally the reason why you like why these things continue on which is why again I expect the basics from humans doing your best and you are doing your best you're just failing certain standards you're failing my standard that's for sure you're failing most of my family's standard doing your best is great we all are doing our best it'd be a little bit nicer if you did more than that but that is a challenge this comment says what is being a good man versus a good person I don't think there's much of a difference unless you're in a very specific cultural bubble so in my world being a good person a consciousness trumps your gender but I'm progressive and I believe that gender is one of those things that's personal and has little to do with good or bad. It has mostly to do with the relationship you're having with yourself and others, which could coincide into the recipe and criteria for good and bad. But again, those things are subjective. So you're right. What is the difference between being a good man and a good person? It's through the lens in which you observe yourself. So for some people, they have a standard for what a man is and a woman is, and they want to be good based off that standard. This is so personal and subjective to you that I don't want society to decide what and when you're good I want you to decide and then I want society to learn to live within that like that reality that we all define it differently I'd say there's never many really good men at one time haven't really gone anywhere always coming and going I try to be a good man others have told me I am I think selfishness greed hatred weakness are the kinds of things that would take away from that I don't think good men are in a decline maybe just taking longer to cook I do think that the standard in which you mature has changed and shifted and always has depending on where you are you take it back to the prodigal son right that, like that's a standard of what is maturing and how fast and so I do think that there is enough good people to find good partners but again this is a very large planet we're all over the world my partner wasn't an American I'm not a European and yet we found each other thank God because the internet exists but what if it didn't maybe I would never would have found a partner because again I was more than happy to be single than settle for a relationship in which I don't think my partner fits the standard of my lifestyle and again we'll go over my criteria in just a bit because I think that will make more sense when I get there but I will say I don't think it's something as simple as, oh, the apps are the reason people aren't finding people. Oh, it's the TV. It's the porn. It's the drug. It's not. It's just humans. Human beings are always the creators, arbiters, and people who are in the most control over their happiness and joy. And we fail ourselves. Society doesn't fail us. I just don't think it does. I think it can, depending on how you're interacting with society. But if you push society away, and you're just thinking about yourself as an individual because that's what my channel is focused on. The world is already focused on making you a good one of them. But what if you were just one of you? What is the standard you hold yourself to? Because if you don't have one outside of somebody else telling you what your standard is, then who are you?
Who are you really? Which is why it's ironic that Sneeko wants to escape the matrix by joining a different one. Religion is a form of matrix. Ideology is a form of matrix. Religion is ideology. So again, you can say you're an independent thinker. You can say you're escaping the matrix, but you can't trade one matrix for another. That doesn't work. At least to me. Okay, we're almost going to jump into my criteria. But before we do, I recently, uh, one of my homies was telling me how she's like in her straight girl phase right now where she's like, I'm going to see my husband. I'm going to see my, and I was like, you don't have a husband. And she's like, I know, but I'm in that mood right now via Beyonce. Do you guys know that clip of Beyonce saying like, I'm going to go see my husband. I'm going to see, whatever. And I am on to see my husband. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. And it's weird seeing Beyonce be so in love with Jay-Z since he cheated on her and he's a weak piece of shit. But sure, you do your, you, you do you, Queen Bee. I think people who have infidelity can fix those things and sickness and health. And there's definitely a sickness to cheating. And I think that's possible. But I am never going to be that straight. I don't really want a husband, even though I call my partner husband. I don't really want a husband. I want a partner. And I want a consciousness. And I don't care about the fact that he's a man. And I don't care about the fact that he's male and I don't care. None of those things matter to me at all. So I'm not straight because, you know, I'm not. I'm queer, but I'm not. And I'm pansexual, but I'm not straight enough to find that cute. I think it's kind of puts me off. It makes me like not like it. But that's not because it's bad or good. It's good to celebrate the fact that you have a husband and that you have a wife and you're excited about it. I think that's romantic and I get why you want to do it. But know your category of person. I like being called wife. I like being called partner. But ultimately, I'd rather just be called Brittany. I'd rather just be called like my love. I'd rather just be called, you know, love of my life. I'd rather be focused or centered. I, how do I say that? I'd rather our relationships center on who we are and not like what we are. Does that make sense? Though, I, of course, like what you are is who you are. Possibly, maybe there's a whole thing that goes into it, depending on the kind of person you are. Okay, so. Brittany's criteria. I have four categories. Okay. So get your notebooks out, do it yourself at home. I'll put it up on the screen so you guys can see what I'm doing. I put them into four categories, starting with, okay, attraction. First and foremost, the basics, especially now with dating apps, since that's the first thing we see. Often we're at the bar, it's the first thing we see. Even in arranged marriages, you're seeing the criteria of the possibilities of like making babies. Are you guys going to be compatible long term for family, usually lineage, attraction, physical attraction? Now, I wrote down sexual and I wrote down my requirements. So I need them to be progressive or open-minded, people who are open to exploring, people who are not sex shy, people who are sex positive, people that are not going to get, you know, oh, I can't believe we're using a vibrator. Like, what is my dick not enough? Like, I cannot deal with that. Or, oh, what do you mean we need a strap on? Are my fingers not enough? It's like, I, I can't deal with that. We are either going to use every tool at our disposal to have the best sex life or you can move, you can move out. You know what I'm saying? So for me, sexual attraction is number one. Am I physically attracted to you? Am I chemistry attracted to you? Am I conscientiously attracted to you? Like, you know, in my head, am I attracted to the person you are? And of course, am I attracted to the way you hold yourself? So, you know, the relationship they have with their body, the relationship they have with how they present themselves, their hygiene, the way they take care of themselves, all of these things coincide with sexual attraction to me. And of course, some of those requirements need time. Like I need time to get to know them. Like if I'm attracted to them in my head, that's like a very specific relationship I'm having with them. But it also, I think, signals automatically with the way they hold themselves. So I can do the math of this person takes showers, therefore this person probably has a good relationship with hygiene. And I can do the math in my head before even talking to them. They're like, oh, we might have some attraction there, right? One of the examples I wrote down was there's this Netflix show about this woman, British lady or something, who makes sex rooms and sex dungeons for couples. And she's like HGTV, but for sex dungeons. And it's pretty basic and pretty vanilla, even though it's kink. And it's pretty just like introducing kink to the most basic people in the world, which I love. And if you were to watch that show and think it's degenerate or disgusting, like we're never getting married. I am not interested because I have one life on this earth and I would like to explore things with my partner in a monogamous way because I'm currently like in forever monogamous with my partner. That's what we decided. But 
example is that that is such a watered down version of BDSM that I have seen. And if you can't even handle that, you're not going to be able to handle me. So when you're looking for your partner, you have to think to yourself, hey, is our sexual chemistry going to be good enough? Are we going to be compatible in how we explore our bodies? What if I have body issues? What if I've been assaulted? What if I need you to be kind to me? What if I'm afraid to have sex with the lights on? Are these things we're, are these things things we're going to tackle together? For me, I have sex with the lights on or the lights off, but like I prefer the lights on because I want to look at my partner. I want to make eye contact. I want us to open up our bodies and explore them together. For some couples, they never have sex with the lights on. And I just couldn't even imagine that. How do you make love when you can't even see your partner? I want to see them. Now, again, certain positions won't allow us to see them, which I've also heard from some women. They don't have sex where they can see their partners because they don't want to share that intimacy. I've been there. In my past, I had a hard time looking at my partner's, like it, in my partner's eyes. It was too vulnerable. But now, with this person, I want to show them every part of me. I want to be 1000% vulnerable with them. And so, again, I think there's a relationship we're having where we think like sex is just automatically going to be good or sex is automatically going to be compatible. But you should talk about these things before you get together. And then you should test it out if you would like. For me and my partner, we definitely tested it out. It was good to go. That was a big requirement because he lived over, you know, he lived in Europe and I live in America. And so one of the requirements was making sure that we liked each other in every way. You get what I'm saying? So hugely important for people like me, hugely important for me. The second part of the criteria is lifestyle of the relationship. So this is, are we a we couple, a you and I couple? Are we a religious couple or a secular couple? Are we a sex positive couple or a sex repressed couple? Are we uh, very specifically like a, a Disney couple or a Star Wars couple? <laughs> are we a very, what kind of couple are we? Now, my partner and I are hyper individuals, though we're very conscientious about being good community members, but we're mostly island people, meaning he lives on an island, I live on an island, and now we're combining islands. We're not people who at this stage in our life integrated a lot of our every day to the community. In my 20s, I was heavily involved in communities. I was going to like feminist events and BDSM events. Every night after work, I would have an event to go to. But the recent years, especially through COVID, it's really been isolated for myself and my partner. Of course, we didn't know each other at the time because we'd met just over a year ago. But for us, we were living in these different ice islands that we created for ourselves. We made our own bubbles, if you will, right? Our own way of existing. And then we had good relationships with our communities. And we are conscientious about those things. But the type of relationship we actually have now is is very like private and very much about us. Like we have friends, we have people we like, but it hasn't been a focus of ours to integrate our life with like a weekly brunch with our friends, a weekly like this with our friends, because we're not those people. We could have been at a certain time in our life, but I just don't think it's interesting to me right now. Future Brittany can make different decisions about that if she wants to change it. And him and I are open to adapting to that because, again, we want to adapt. We want to adapt. We want to adapt. But right now with the people that we are, our lifestyles match. And again, as we change lifestyle, if I wanted to integrate, let's say I became a con person where I was like, hey, we go to yearly cons, which used to be me in Seattle. I used to go to Emerald City Comic Con all the time. I used to have certain con conventions for BDSM I would go to. I don't do that anymore. But let's say I told him, hey, babe, I would like to start doing cons every year. Him and I would have to negotiate that. Are you open to it? Do you want to come with me? Should I go with friends? Should I go alone? Is this too much? Can we even afford it in our budget? How do we feel about this? This is a conversation in which our relationship is a we conversation, a we relationship. Do we want to do this? Do I, am I able to do this without you? Should I do it without you? Not as a rejection of him, but because I believe in his consent, I want him to choose not to follow me on every adventure I want to go on. And at the same time, we want to do as much of life together as we can. So thank goodness I ended up with someone who's an anime person. I ended up with somebody who's nerdy enough to want to go to conventions. I ended up with somebody who's a homebody enough not to feel bad if we don't go to conventions. I ended up with a perfect person, a person who gets to wake up every day with me and then decide, do we want to do this? And then be okay with not doing it. I'm never going to feel bad if we don't do something. And I'm always going to feel lucky if we get around to doing something. But for us, doing something is also just spending time together, sitting out on the balcony, eating some seeds, you know, it's a pastime activity, hanging out, discussing life, discussing this, discussing my work, 
that is a great, great pastime for us. And for us, that's enough. But for some people, it's not. For some people, they're like, I want to be a traveling couple. I want to be a Broadway couple. I want to be a couple that goes to shows every, I love that. Do that. But make sure you're picking someone who gets it, right? Picking somebody who understands the lifestyle. Like I have a friend who does ballet professionally. And when people date her, it's like really cool at first. Like, oh, I'm dating a ballerina. But then they realize like, oh, that means she's moving around every year or she's not available all the time or she's working all the time. And so people start to realize like, oh, is this the lifestyle I want? It's very hard to date people who have a lifestyle that you romanticize like Mr. Beast. You might romanticize how famous he is and how rich he is. But then Jimmy always says like, I have to conscientiously make time for my partner. It's not that easy. I'm almost not accessible. And so you, again, you have to separate the fantasy of what you think might be your relationship to the reality. So these alpha males who work as like, you know, 80 hours, 100 hours a week, they'll say these women need to respect the fact that they're not going to be available. And it's true to some extent, which is why I don't want to date someone who works 100 hours a week because I am needy. I also don't want to date somebody who has a night job. Like I don't want to date a nurse because as much as I respect nurses and they're amazing, you guys work really hard. You work so hard that I'm not sure I could deal with the requirements of being a good supportive partner in that situation. And that's what I'm trying to explain to people is we're not, well, you don't have to pull someone down to find what's good for your joy. What often happens though is people think, oh, I have to make sure the religious know I hate their lifestyles and that's why being progressive is better. Or I hate the progressives and that's why being religious is better. It's like, or you do you and I do me. So pick your perfect ideal relationship lifestyle and find a partner partner who complements that. You don't have to settle. You can if you'd like, but you don't have to. The last key point in the relationship lifestyle that I think is vital and very different from other bubbles, especially bubbles that talk about what a good man is, is that for us, gender cannot matter. It, it, it comes up. But if gender matters in how we are orchestrating the success of this relationship, we've already failed. My relationship, his relationship, my partner's, we need to form a relationship that is about the success of the relationship. And for us, gender would get in the way. It would probably, if we focused on it too much, if it became a thing, it would probably make us break up. Because it's so not important for the success of this particular relationship. But for other people, they really want to be the woman. They really want to be the man. It's really important. So make sure you know if you're that kind of person or if you're a person like me who like doesn't care about gender. I just care about the success of the relationship. The third part of the requirement is how they interact with the world. What kind of a community member or lack of community member is your partner? So when you're looking for a good person, I am looking for a good, un, I want them to have a good understanding of are they a good community member, a good partner, or a little bit of both, or one or the other. There was a Queer Eye episode that really stood out to me, actually multiple episodes, where these women were so dedicated to being good community members, they neglected their home life, their mental health, the relationship with their husbands. I don't want someone who's such an amazing community member that they put our relationship on the back burner. I don't want someone who's so focused on our relationship that we put communities on the back burner if, if, if paying attention to those communities coincides with our values. So my partner and I, we try really hard to be good community members while living on an island. We want to be good community members. We want to be very thoughtful as much as we can be to our community, but at the same time, we're going to prioritize our relationship, but not at the sacrifice of the community necessarily. This is very specific because I think when we have these conversations, we might be thinking of situations that will probably never happen. You know what I mean? And so my partner and I are just trying to deal with the reality we are in now. So as an example, the other day we were out for our evening walk and we saw these people on these like motorized scooters you can rent in the cities and then put them on the sidewalks. And I get very frustrated that people put them in the middle of the sidewalks or they lay them on the ground or they, they are, I don't think they're good community members. I think they are making the community worse and it makes me want to burn everything to the ground when it is so simple to just put the scooter on the side of the sidewalk so people can walk by. But instead these people, mostly young people, will just put it right in the middle of the sidewalk. And I just think, that is not being a good community member. Like people who don't return the shopping carts and leave them in the middle of the shopping, the parking lot. You're not being a good community member. Like you have failed Britney's standard. But for some people, that is being a good community member because what's the big deal? 
But what's the big deal again is the base. It's like the basic. It's like the l- minimum requirement of at least you didn't hit a child with your scooter, I guess. At least you just left it there. But for me, I want them to rise above a little bit. So the other day, we saw this girl and she had parked the scooter next to herself in the middle of the sidewalk and then she, it fell over. And I looked at her because it startled me and she looked at me. But she, I think because she was embarrassed, she didn't pick up the scooter. It's not hers. She's renting it. But she didn't pick it up. She just left it there. And then I watched her for a long time to see if she would pick it up again. She never did. Her friends arrived and they went to the beach and she never picked up the scooter. And I thought to myself, like, this is what makes me want to live on an island and not deal with other people. Because I think this is an easy fix and she couldn't even do it. She couldn't even do the most basic thing. Pick up the scooter pick it up so my partner and I after they left went over and picked it up and put it on the side of the sidewalk so in that instance I think we were being good community members well I think she was being a bad one does that mean she's a bad person probably not does that mean she fits the criteria for being a good partner to me or someone like me yeah she, if my partner did that if he was the kind of man that would use a public like a shared thing and leave it in a disgruntled way, in someone else's way, I I would instantly fall out of attraction with him. I couldn't even imagine being that person. Or the people who let their dogs like poop on the sidewalks and they don't pick it up. I couldn't be with somebody like that. I couldn't be with somebody that was such a bad community member that they allowed their dog to poop in a public place and didn't pick it up. I just think it says so much about your character when you don't have a good relationship with your community and at the same time I don't need you to volunteer your time every day at the shelter I just need you when you're in public to participate in a way that makes sense in the little ways that you can pick up your poop move your scooters to the side of the road and then the fourth and I think probably the most important is how do they see themselves what's the relationship your partner has with themselves in order to be a good or bad person do they have a relationship where they're constantly having like a cognitive dissonance between their weaknesses and their strengths lila rose was the conservative woman on the whatever podcast which by the way blast from the past of my pro-life days okay lila rose was on the podcast having an argument with this alpha guy and she was saying it's funny that you talk about being you know disciplined and you have strength in these areas but when it comes to sleeping around around you're weak and he was getting very offended at this he has a very poor relationship with how he sees himself he sees himself as disciplined but can't understand that he's also weak and the fact that he has a like a cognitive dissonance with this part of his reality his image would disqualify him from being my partner if I can't talk to you and say hey I think you're failing at reaching your bare requirements of like discipline here and you get defensive you have disqualified yourself from being my partner I need someone who can genuinely face themselves. I need someone who goes, okay, yeah, I think I am doing that. I probably am getting defensive. I think you are right. I think I trust you to be having a real conversation with me. Now, to be fair, my partner and I, because we went into this relationship with radical honesty, because we went with radical truth and radical sharing, I think we've created such a safe space to share those feelings that we we minimally get defensive. Like sometimes I'll get defensive for like a second and he'll be like, hey, I feel like there might be slight defensiveness here. And I'll be like, hold on, let me check my toxic masculinity. Okay, I think you might be right. And I'm like, okay, let me talk about this. Sometimes it takes me a while. Sometimes it takes him a while. The idea is that I need someone who can face themselves. So if you have a poor relationship with yourself, I need you to have it over there. Now, Are there points or things in my life I still need to work on? Are there things in my partner's life he still needs to work on? Yes. But what we do as partners is cheerlead each other on without making those things our burdens. So I have anxieties. I have spirals. I have intrusive thoughts. I try really hard not to make that my partner's problem, but I don't do it in a way that shames me in the process for even having them. Instead, I try to say, hey, just so you know, like I'm low on spoons. I think I'm getting hangry. I'm not perfect at it. Sometimes I really don't realize it for just a second. And then he has to point it out. And then sometimes it's my job to allow him to point it out. But I really need someone I trust 1000% to even point it out in the first place or someone who I know isn't going to force me in their direction by pointing it out. So instead of making those moments about our partners, we try to make them about ourselves. Again, we're creating boundaries that are for us. I'm open, but I have boundaries. Boundaries are about us. Hey, 
I see you're going through something. I need to put down a boundary while you're going through it. I'm not shaming you for going through it, but I need some space from this energy. Is that okay? Hey, I see that you're having this like conundrum. You're thinking about work or you're thinking about X, Y, and Z. Is it okay if I kind of step away and let you deal with it because it's like a little bit too much for me? This is open communication. This is saying I acknowledge something is happening and I can't help you with this, but I want you to know I love you and I support you and I'm here for you, but I need to step away. I am literally dying. I remember when my brothers first met my partner, they were so critical with him. They like tore him apart in many ways and he just handled it so well that it impressed them. He didn't get defensive. If my brothers, because my brothers, um, my farm brother in particular is Catholic and him and Lila Rose probably overlap with a lot of values. My brother would have asked this alpha guy the same question because in my brother's Catholic bubble, it is disciplined and valuable to deny yourself temptation of uh, infidelity. So the fact that this alpha guy is saying he's a good man, but he sleeps around would disqualify him from my brother's criteria of what a good man is. The relationship that man is having with his own weaknesses would be kind of disgusting to my brother because my brother is a man and does understand temptation and still manages to focus on loving his wife and his four kids because that is the way that he, they have decided in their relationship to live their, their life, right? My brother also does support groups for men with porn addictions and he helps men with their sort of temptation journey. So my brother isn't um, just isolated. He has a community in which he encourages them to be more disciplined. And that is the religious bubble. And that's great. But he would also ask this elf of a guy, you know, why are you weak when it comes to sex? And the elf guy would probably get defensive with my brother. And my brother would see that defensiveness and think less of that man. Because when you are weak, and we're all weak, we all have weaknesses. And you act like you're not it's disgusting. It's gross. Because that means you have such a bad relationship with yourself. And here you are lecturing the world about the relationship they're having with their selves. Who is this alpha guy who can't even keep it in his pants? Who does he think he is lecturing the world? I hate when weak people who don't acknowledge their weakness lecture others. It is so gross. But it also is so human. And yet they're doing their best. So is he a good person? Yeah, based off of his own standard. Does he reach my standard of a good man? No, because he can't acknowledge his own weakness. Not good. Not good. All right, so now that we're at this point in the podcast, we've gone over certain concepts. And ultimately, my channel is always about the individual and how to make it work for you within the world, right? Because the world already has so many community efforts, group efforts, matrix efforts, whatever that means that I wanna know what individuals are doing out here. But I think it does start with a self-awareness that I think is hard to handle. Sometimes I have callers or I have people in my comments who will say things like, you know, Brittany, I am a good man. I work really hard. I think I can't find these modern women attractive. I think I'm gonna to move to a foreign country or go to a foreign country to find women who are more traditional so I can marry those women. And I think there's something weak about that. I think there's something that signals to me that you can't contend with the, how the world has gone and you want to stay stagnant in the bubble you're in. And then in some ways, I think that says to me, I know who I am and I know what I want. But again, what are you really offering? If I looked at you and I really looked at your resume and I said, can you actually be the breadwinner? Do you have consistent income? Do you actually have a savings? Can you support a stay-at-home wife? Most men right now can't in the American economy, but they might be able to in foreign countries. So maybe you might move to a foreign country to find a more traditional woman in an economy that requires less of you than the U.S., which is good because then you can have the fantasy of being the breadwinner while having the traditional stay-at-home wife, but you can't do it in America. Or maybe you push yourself to be able to do that in America like my farm brother has. He supports four kids with his own job. He's an independent contractor, independent business owner. He runs his own, you know, work from home. He has four kids and a stay-at-home wife, right? She has no intention of ever working. But he dedicates so much of his time gaining the skills to make sure that he can contend in his marketplace so he can have that lifestyle. He lives in a cheap state in a country land. He organizes his life around Jesus Christ because, you know, he's they're Catholic. They organize their life in that way to make it happen in America. And it is not easy. It is incredibly hard on them. You know, he just got into his 30s. It's very hard on them to contend with this economy. And they're doing it, but it is not easy. 
And to find that wife, he had to look in his religious bubble. But if you're a secularist who wants a traditional woman, but you're also uniquely like maybe sex positive, that's con- that can be very difficult, right? So depending on your bubble and where you are and your belief system and your opinions on relationships, I think people set themselves up for failure. Or sometimes I'll hear a person say, I really want to get married. Oh, but I can't stick to anything. I get bored and I always want to change it up. You know, in marriage, you don't change it up. Usually in marriage, if you're talking about long-term cohabitation, not just like legal marriage, but long-term partnership, you're not changing it up. You have the same partner. So do you really want to get married? Or maybe somebody says like, I want to be a stay-at-home partner. But they're dating somebody who's maybe 30s and 40s and still doesn't have their career going. Do you want to be a stay-at-home partner? Because you're not dating somebody to get that. And then again, are you dating someone because of the lifestyle that coincides with the values and coincides with the consciousness that is them? Is love enough? I think you need a whole human being, a whole relationship. Not a perfect person because perfection doesn't exist. It's a disease of a nation, as Beyonce says. But you need somebody who is truly reflecting the reality of what you guys are negotiating to have because I think it's really easy to make promises to yourself and others I think it's really easy to play house I think it's really easy to say I'm a good man I'm a good woman but if you don't have a standard to reach then what are you good according to are you good according to saying it and feeling good and getting that dopamine hit Are you good because you did an action that proved to you that you reached a height of like discipline or relationship with the self or relationship with your partner? What is your good based off of? Mine is a standard. Mine is coinciding with values. Values that I collected and created. I'm a secularist, so my values don't come from religion. They come from my own understanding of what joy is. So they're subjective. And finding a person who fits that was difficult but also it was sort of probably always going to happen in some ways because I I'm a public figure I post content online of course somebody eventually was going to come across my content and say uh that kind of sounds interesting I think we might have a lot in common of course that was bound to happen right which is great because I've been sending out this little beacon for years like are you my person are you my person are you my person and finally it happened which makes sense but I had to challenge myself and become the person that I am now to be compatible with the person that he is in order to have a cohesive relationship. Again, we would not have been compatible in our 20s. So this idea of like, why didn't you get married when you were younger? Well, because I wasn't the person who would have been compatible with my person. He wasn't the person to be compatible with me. We had to grow into those people separately and then come together. That was our story. Your story might be different. Leave comments in the sections down below telling me your stories. I'd love to hear them. Thank you for all your comments. Thank you for everyone who participated in this discussion. Thank you to the person on Discord who left me that comment. If you would have, if you, if you would like your comment on Discord to possibly be turned into a video, join our Discord. It's a lot of fun. I will talk to you guys soon. I am going to go. That is what I wanted to say today. And yeah. Okay, links in the description for everything I covered. Please check out that story, Good Men Are Hard to Find. It's really, really interesting. And the audio by Hannah's books is really good. I would love to hear your opinions on it. Okay, I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me Cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the